All right, guys, welcome to chapter two of your textbook, and we're going to talk about asset creation uh, and really a hodgepodge of a whole bunch of other stuff. So first thing we want to talk about is um, at this stage in, in the, at this level or age of the gaming industry, do 2D games still sell? So think about that for a second. You know, what 2D games do you play? And if you made it like a 2D platform or something like that, do you think it would still sell today? What kind of sales do you think you would have? All right, so think about that for a minute, and then let's look at, at a few different examples of, of 2D-based uh, voxel games. So uh, most of you that are big into games have heard of Terraria. Uh, after Minecraft came out, Terraria came out strictly 2D, um, picture in the background, and your, your people walk on a little land, and this is kind of like auto-generated terrain. Uh, Terraria, as of January 2014, had sold over 2.5 million copies. Now, the game was selling for $20, but assuming that they only made $5 per copy, that would be $12 million. Now, the last time I checked, which was just recently, um, it has now been released on several platforms and has now sold over 12 million copies. So last I looked on Steam, it was still selling for like $14. Um, there were Steam sales when it was $9.99. Uh, and Steam, I think, only takes 30% of the games when you sell it. So uh, imagine just how much money they made just from that one game. Uh, if they made $12 million on 2,000 copies, how much do you think they made out of 12,000 copies? All right, and not just that. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of Starbound, but again, it's it really it's a Terraria ripoff. Uh, it's the same 2D stuff, voxel base, you dig in the ground, you make little houses out of blocks, that kind of stuff. Um, Starbound, Starbound sales topped 1 million after the first month on Steam Early Access. Uh, as of January, or I'm sorry, July 8th, 2015, uh, it's still listed as Early Access in beta. 91% uh, of the 43,000 reviews are positive. Now think back, how many times have you purchased a game and then reviewed it on Steam? Or, how many times have you played a game, really liked it, and then went back to Steam and done a review? So, 43,000 people have gone back and done a review, and 91% are positive. So, again, huge sales. So, then there's also Edge of Space that sells really well. Signs of Life is a newer one, still again, still in early access, but still the exact same 2D format. Uh, there's Kriya. Uh, and then there's Windforge, which is kind of has a, a neat thing, like you kind of like fly around and uh, attack giant monsters and whales and weird stuff. Uh, but again, they're all 2D games. So just in the last couple of years, all these 2D games have come out. Uh, they're filling that niche of, hey, I just want to build something, I want to create stuff, um, I want to be able to jump in, have fun for 15 minutes, and then maybe do something else. Um, and it's a niche that really needs to be filled. So there is still a huge market for 2D games. All right, and really, once you have like, and this is Steam's um, terrain engine, um, and you can do these uh, these 2D voxel things, and check out this video. All right, and no, that's not my music. That's the, from the. Thank <laughs> you. 
the idea I mean really it's pretty freaking easy uh, to use these tools and do that stuff so the, the problem is you know we don't know about the tools and we don't know how to use them but once you kind of get that knowledge then it, it seems like it's relatively easy all right so what can you make so originally we were going to have you do two projects in this class um, a game of your own uh, and then the game in the book but that's not really going to work because even at this point um, you really haven't used unity yet and now you only have 14 weeks left. And building a game with only 14 weeks left and having to do your own hour assets and things like that um, is probably not going to happen. But if you're thinking about doing your own game, again, as long as you purchase this book, you have access to those art assets um, and anything that, that's in these packs that we give you. So you're free to use any of that stuff in your own game. So think small. Start with a, a very small idea. Um, what kind of game 2D style would you like to make? And then what kind of feeling do you want the user to experience? Do you want the user to be, oh, this is so cool because I can make stuff? Um, do you want the user to, oh, this is so exciting because it's a, not like a PvP game? So you have to think about you know, what you want to design your game around. You know, what, what kind of emotional response do you want to get from the user? And then start kind of designing your game on paper. A lot of times we want to write a couple of things down on, on like one piece of paper. Oh, I'm gonna have a game. It's gonna have a PvP, and I'm gonna shoot people. There's gonna be grenades and cool rocket jumping and blah blah. And then we jump right into Unity and we start trying to make it. Stuff like that fails miserably because then once you get into it, you realize, oh crap, I didn't think of this. I didn't think of this. I got all this work to do. Blah blah. But if you think small, hey, I just want to make a 2D platformer. Um, I want to make three levels, and it's gonna do this. And then you kind of map it on paper. Okay, the first level is going to kind of look like this on paper. And maybe you got to string a whole bunch of paper together to design the first level. And that way you can design different obstacles and whatnot. Or maybe you do a storyboards. Hey, I'm going to have this, and then I'm going to have this, and then I'm going to have this. Uh, and you just you, it's all on uh, pieces of paper that's posted on your wall or something. But you get the idea. So plan the whole project out first so you can see how big it is. A lot of people want to make an MMO. And really... When you think about the assets and, and the man hours that goes into an MMO, it's just crazy. You know, Star Wars The Old Republic had over 300 people working on that uh, at any given time uh, and cost $150 million. You know, even your smallest MMOs, you know, it takes several developers and a couple years uh, to live on uh, in order to build that stuff. So, start small and there's other ideas and things that you can do as well like let me, I'm gonna jump over to the unity asset store real quick so here I am in the unity asset store and there's a, a 2d platform there's the Corgi engine and for 50 bucks you get all of this stuff to make a, a complete 2d platformer and you know you get all the art assets these are all just the prefabs that are pre-programmed for you so they all are already animated they already do their stuff uh, you get all these other assets but you get everything you need to make a level or several levels all based on their assets Yeah, 
Sorry about that. I don't know if that's my internet or if that's because I'm filming at the same time and recording. Da, 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 but, you get the idea. but all these art assets come in this package. Um, and then a bunch of reviews. So 96 reviews and has five stars. So, and there's two or three other packages like this that are still way under $100, give you a complete game. And then you can take these assets, uh, uh, design a whole new 2D platformer around it with whole new levels. Uh, and then maybe you can just change the, the look of the characters. Uh, and then maybe you do a, uh, a user interface based on uh, the iPhone and then you release it on the iStore or the Apple Store. Or you go to Steam and release it for a couple bucks. So you make a 2D platformer, you change some of the art assets a little bit. Uh, so you only sell 10,000 copies worldwide. Well, if it's three bucks and Steam takes 30%, then you're going to make $2.10. So $2.10 and you sell 10,000 copies, that's $20,000. Uh, and that's enough to kind of like get you in the next phase. And then you spend a little more money and you make a little bit bigger project or you make some more levels for your game. or you know. But you get the idea. So you start small and then you kind of snowball it from there. All right, so moving on. So getting back to Unity, what is an asset? When I talk about assets, what are assets? Well, any of our 3D models, um, scripts or little pieces of code, plugins that do different things like there's a, a, a multiplayer networking plugin so that you can have multiplayer in your game. There's audio files, textures um, to wrap around different things to give them different looks. All of that are assets. We typically when we say asset we think art asset but scripting, plugins, audio files, all that stuff is, is really considered an asset. And, it can, and most of those can be found on the, on the asset store or uh, there's a listing uh, that we'll talk about later on uh, on the Unity site. So to get assets into Unity, we can go inside Unity and just import there, um, or we can import from the file browser, or we can create it new from inside Unity, or we can import from the asset store. So there's lots of ways to get assets into Unity. Um, and again, Unity has the, the, the terrain engine uh, where you can make 2D assets, um, voxel base so people can like blow different parts of the environment up. Uh, so it's all there in Unity. You just, we just got to figure out how to use it. All right, and then here's that website I was telling you about. So it's http colon forward slash forward slash answers dot unity 3d dot com slash questions slash blah slash game. But you get the idea. So make sure you copy that from the slide. And that really doesn't show up. I need, probably need to change the color. But here is a listing of a bunch of free and paid assets, textures, models, audio packs, that kind of stuff um, that are just awesome. Like we've already talked about um, opengameart.org, but there's a whole bunch of these. There's 67 of these that offer free um, assets for your games. And most of the time, you just have to credit the artist. So, you know, in the credits that nobody ever watches anyway, you just, hey, they, you know, this, was, this asset was by Joe Donut. And that was one of the big reasons that we stuck with Unity rather than moving to Unreal, because that was a tough decision. Uh, you know, Unreal, obviously, for as far as 3D goes, um, does make better looking games or the graphics uh, than Unity. Uh, but it's close. Unity's getting better all the time. But Unity has so much more other stuff going for it. Um, like on the Unity store, there are so many assets that are free. There are so many other websites that have free assets. There's so many tutorials on Unity out there. Uh, if there's something you're working on for your game and you can't get your jetpack to work or you can't get the, the light to explode from the barrel, stuff like that, there are so many tutorials on YouTube that will show you how to do that stuff. So that was the issue that we had with Unreal. At this point in time we, when we're designing the classes, uh, there just weren't as enough books, there weren't a whole lot of choices for the, the textbooks, uh, there's not a whole lot of tutorials online, and the asset store doesn't have a lot of free assets, um, and then most of the assets are way more like in Unity, most of the assets are 30 bucks or less. where on the Unreal Store, they're 30 bucks or more. So we thought, you know, if you're going to be an, an indie game developer, which in our area, that's kind of really what you're focusing on. Um, you're going to do some indie stuff to kind of get recognized out there in the real world first. Uh, you need to you need to get the <laughs> the stuff cheap. So that's kind of why we went there. So don't forget, the Asset Store has a ton of other stuff. Um, you can also always go to the the, the Asset List website uh, and find Asset on all these different sites. Just make sure, though, you know, if you get some free assets from a site or somewhere, 
uh, and then your 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 game sells and you make twenty thousand dollars, you know, go drop a donation to back to those sites that that have helped you out, so they can kind of keep in business and keep helping future gamers. All right, Unity formats. Um, Unity takes files um, from tons of different commercial products. Uh, 3D Max is a big one. Now, 3D Max is kind of expensive, um, though, but if, as long as you're a student here at the college, I think you get it for free. Um, the problem is once you leave the college, you don't get it for free anymore. At least that's my understanding. Um, Blender is a free program that's very much like 3D Max. Um, doesn't have quite the bells and whistles um, as that. And then GIMP. GIMP is a free one, and then Maya is out there too. So most of us are going to go to Blender and start making our assets. So if you go to the Unity page, you can see the supported formats, um, but it, it takes almost everything. Um, as far as image formats, I take GIF, I take BMPs, um, JPEGs, PNGs, and then for audio format, I take MP3s, I take WAV files, I take OGGs. Uh, for videos, I take you know pretty much everything, MP4s, AVI, MPEG, MOV, text formats I take so unity supports a boatload of formats you can just kind of drop your stuff in uh, and then unity says "Ooh, I'll take that and it pours it right in all right if you're ever making your own assets you know there's Microsoft paint now obviously Microsoft paint and this little guy is not going to work but you can uh, later on in this video I'm going to show you um, another video on YouTube uh, where they talk about using paint to kind of create your own sprites so when you first get started, if you don't have any money for these programs, you know, paint's a, a perfectly way to make your first sprite. All right, then there's Blender. Blender, again, is free, and it's an awesome tool. A lot of uh, assets are coming out of that. And then let's talk about these assets. You know, once you learn Blender and you start making assets, um, then you can sell your assets on the Unity Store. You can sell them on your own store. You can have the Unity Store. Hey, here's my asset, and it points to your uh, web page. And that can be a source of revenue. You can make money from audio files that, that you're pushing there on the Unity Store, uh, art assets, and then you can point people to your website where you might have um, Google Ads from AdSense uh, so that you're making money from there. But then you're getting a following. You know, developers are buying your products. They're starting to follow you. Other gamers start kind of hearing about you and they kind of following your stuff. So more and more people go to your site. Maybe you make some tutorial videos on YouTube and you monetize those. Um, and that brings people to your site. So before you even develop your first game, and as you're making art assets and, and sound assets and instructional videos on how to do this stuff, you can maybe be making money off of all that stuff on the side to kind of help fund your game. So we all think, oh man, great, I want to learn how to make a game, I want to make a big game, I want to make a big, big bunch of money. Sadly, that's not how it works. You know, it works more as, you know, I start learning how to create assets, I start selling those, I make some sound files, I start selling those, um, I start making some tutorial videos, I start selling those, and all the while I'm doing this stuff, I'm planning my game. Um, I'm designing the levels and things like that. So that by the time I actually do make my first game and I release it, you know, I've got quite a big following that I can then push out, hey guys, here's this is going to be my first game. And then hopefully it sells. All right, so in Unity, if you want to create a new asset, you can just go to Asset, Create, and then create a material, create a lens flare, create a texture, um, all that stuff. You can also create sprites and other things. All right, game objects. Anything in the hierarchy tab or anything that you place in the game is a game object. It's just an object placed in the game. And then the inspector tab holds the components for the game. So here I have the hero game object, and the hero game object is positioned here in the inspector, and the script that controls him is here. If I don't like how fast he jumps or how fast he moves, I can change it here. So that's another neat thing about Unity. You know, once I have a, a script, the code that can make my player walk around, uh, let's say I, I find one online and I pop it into my game. At that point, I can make adjustments just from going into the inspector and change speeds and jump heights and stuff that way, which is very easy. So I don't really need a strong coding background. Now, you do need to understand code, um, but you don't have to be a strong coder in order to make a basic game. So just remember, um, game objects are listed in the hierarchy pane. Um, components of game objects are shown in the inspector pane. And we can add components to game objects in the inspector pane. All right, there's also tags. And tags are used to link game objects to scripts. 
you know, when I'm in a script and I'm, I'm coding for the hero, um, I, I can call it hero, but a tag allows me to call it something else. So every time I'm coding, I can just write player because that makes more sense to me. Um, you know, there might be uh, three heroes in the game, um, but I'm making a character controller for the player. So sometimes tags are a little bit easier to make it easier to code or to program the stuff. So, and then here you can see the tag is player. So hero is what we call the game object, but we code and focus on that in the code uh, by using the tag. All right, prefabs. Prefabs are so cool. Prefabs are master copies of game objects, uh, and they're stored in a special folder called prefabs. And they're, because they're master copies, once you move something into um, the game object or whatever, if you make a change to the master, it flows down to all the other copies. So if I have a prefab of the enemies, um, I can just make a change. Let's say oh, I play the game and the enemies seem too tough. I need to take their health down to make it a little bit easier to kill them. I can just change the health on the prefab and then it affects all the other units underneath it. So all my enemy game objects will now have less health. So they're pretty cool. So page um, 38 walks you through creating a prefab out of your player and really all you have to do is just grab the player game object after you've created it and you've done everything with it um, and just drag it down to the prefab folder and that will make it a prefab. So prefabs are not just game assets but they're game assets that are kind of like ready to just kind of plug and play. So I may make a player, I may add a script to make him walk, jump, and all that stuff. I may add the audio files to make him say different things. Um, I may add the animation. And then once I have all those different components in there, then I create it as a prefab. So that I can drop that prefab into other games, uh, and I already have a player that can walk, jump, and do all the other stuff. So that's a prefab. It's really it's a complete kind of asset um, that we can kind of use as a master uh, to pop into our games. So. Prefabs, they can be copied to other games very easily. Um, anytime you have several of the same thing, like enemies, uh, it helps to just create one prefab, and that way you can make changes to all of them. And then anytime you create something that might work in another game, you probably want to turn it into a prefab and then save it um, so that you have access to that later on. So, how does a person get into the, the uh, gets a job in the game industry? So you're sitting there, you're like, man, it's all cool. I don't really want to necessarily launch a game, or maybe I do, but how do I get into the game industry? How do I get Valve to call me? So my best advice to you is start small. You know, pick a niche or two and get something out there for people to see. Like find a game that you'd like. Um, you know, be it Left 4 Dead. You know, if you're trying to get a job with Valve, obviously you need to focus on, on one or two Valve products. You know, maybe it's Team Fortress 2 and Left 4 Dead. Um, or maybe it's the, uh, like maybe Blizzard. Maybe you want to go work for Blizzard. Focus on their newest game, Overwatch, things like that. So start small. Build an online presence. You should be online. You should have a, a Facebook page. You know, be on Twitter, um, stuff like that. You should have your own website, maybe a, a blog, that kind of stuff. Now, when you start creating things for games, whether it's you know mods or maps or movies, any whatever you're doing, you need to be receptive to criticism. There are going to be people on the internet that don't like your stuff, and it could be for several reasons. My ten-year-old gets frustrated because a lot of times he'll he'll make YouTube videos on his little channel, and then some you know twenty-four or thirty-year-old will come over, oh stupid squeaker, uh, and call him the name like that just because he's young. So rather than even watch the video or something, as soon as they hear his voice, they're like, oh, squeaker. So, but you have to be receptive to that. You know, the the stupid stuff, oh, you know, you, your voice sounds like crap, blah, blah, blah. You just got to take that with a grain of salt and just pass it on. But the other stuff, hey, you know, you, you, you're you too general in your comments or um, you're, you know, you're too hard on 2D games or stuff like that. Um, think about that stuff. You know, if four or five people tell you um, that you're too hard on 2D games or something like that or that your opinion on something is, is wrong, you need to be able to rethink that. You need to be open-minded. All right, stay away from reviewing games. Um, you know, we all watch Angry Joe. We all know that Angry Joe now makes his living off just reviewing games and stuff like that, plus he gets a bunch of free stuff for it. 
um, but he's not getting any job offers from game companies. Um, so critics don't really get job offers. So stay away from game reviews. So once you find your niche or the company that you want to focus on or, or whatever the area that you want to be, you know, maybe artwork is your thing. Maybe stories are your thing. Um, maybe there's a certain company that you want to focus on, stuff like that. Once you've found your niche, then focus on that. So am I, am I going to be making mods for games? You know, there's a bunch of mods for Minecraft. Um, the guys that made Bucket, well, which was a modding utensil, um, got picked up by um, the company for a while. Uh, you can make maps, um, you know, just any kind of map for most of the, like, the shooters, things like that. Uh, making items in the Steam Workshop. Uh, a lot of guys make uh, a nice little side income just from selling stuff in the Steam Workshop. Um, and uh, Sony has a workshop now too where they, you can sell stuff in games uh, like Planetside 2. Uh, new audio sources, you know, maybe you're making audio files, maybe you're making, um, maybe you, like music is a passion of yours, you can make some background music or stuff like that uh, and start offering it for cash. Um, short videos, story writing, you know, game companies, the bigger game companies, need all this stuff. And sometimes the guys that have been doing it for a while uh, either get promoted in the new position so then they need to fill the old position, or the guys that are, have been doing it a while kind of get burned out and don't want to do it anymore and they move on to other companies. Things. But there's always room for, the, for new talent. So let me give an example. If you've ever seen the video Scout vs. Witch, um, and if you haven't seen it you can click here and do it, it's a five minute video made with the source filmmaker. Um, which is free. Or actually, yeah, it was free last time I checked. It got almost 4.5 million views. Once Valve saw that and saw how many people were liking that video and stuff and the quality of it, they got in contact with the guy that made it uh, and they had several discussions back and forth about the video and his love for Valve and stuff like that. And Valve eventually offered him a job. So this guy made a five minute video uh, with some Valve characters and got a job with Valve. So now he's making like intro movies and things like that um, for Valve. All right, Robin Walker. You know, originally Team Fortress was a mod based on another game, I think Counter Strike. And once he made that mod for Team Fortress, or was it was it Counter Strike? I don't know. I can't remember the original game that he made the mod for. But the mod was called Team Fortress. And because so many people played it, it was so cool. He was hired by Valve, and he was the lead. He was the lead designer for Team Fortress 2. And then look how much of that. So you know his career has just skyrocketed. Then Adam Foster, um, Valve hired this guy. Um, he made a, a Minerva mod for Half-Life 2. And then there's another guy that got hired from Valve because he made a he made a, a custom campaign designer. Um, yeah. He made a custom. He was making custom campaigns for Left 4 Dead, and he got picked up by Valve. So Valve, one of their strong points are they don't typically hire conventionally. Like they don't have an HR department that then posts stuff in the newspaper and says, "Hey, Valve is hiring." You know, they focus on their community. They look to see what the community is doing, and they look for talent in the community. But they don't ask the community, hey, who's got this talent? They go out and they find it. You know, hey, who's posting? We need somebody to make promotional videos, uh, to make intro videos, and to get the people excited about our games. Hey, let's go look at uh, YouTube and see who's making these videos and offer them a job. Um, but so a lot of other game companies are starting to follow suit, and they're kind of focusing on this uh, because Valve has been so successful like this. And then Valve also has saved themselves a boatload of money. You know. If Valve puts a job in the paper for a game designer, how many people do you think apply for that job? So now you've got to pay somebody to go through all those different resumes and to narrow it down maybe to 15 or 20 resumes. And then you have to go interview people. And then how long do interviews take? If I just hire, if I just interview 10 people and each interview is only an hour, that's 10 hours of productivity that I'm taking from the company. And then if I hire somebody based on the interview and, and a little bit of work that I saw and he doesn't work out, you, you, you can see how that kind of becomes a, just a big money pit. So if I see somebody who does great work online and I call him up and I have a conversation with him and then it kind of works out, it's so much easier than, than hiring the conventional way. All right, so there's also this video on, on uh, 10 ways to get a job in the game industry. Actually, I think I'm going to fire this one off. Hold on a sec.
Want to get into the video game industry, but don't know where to start? Well, with a little help from Smite developer HiRes Studios, we're here to give you some tips for getting your dream job. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're bringing you the top 10 tips for getting into the gaming industry. Number 10. Check your ego at the door. I know there's a few of you out there that are desperate to see your best idea come to reality, and also dream about getting perfect 10 review scores and winning numerous Game of the Year awards on your first game. But believe us, that is not a likely scenario. One of the biggest misconceptions about video games is thinking that cool concepts alone make a great game. Don't knock on a developer's door saying that you've got the best idea. You won't have been the first. Your great idea has probably been thought of before. We have too many ideas in the game industry. It's all about whether you can execute them well. Number nine, attend developers conferences. While it's not a one size fits all solution for getting in the door, dev conferences can serve as a good way to get other developers to know you. Some conferences may even have panels or workshops on what certain companies are looking for. However, it is absolutely essential that you actually have something to prove before you start rubbing shoulders with some of the industry's best. And don't get discouraged if you don't leave with a killer lead. They go to like GDC or any of these conferences and they kind of put all of their eggs in the networking basket like, oh, I'm going to meet the right person and that's going to get me this job. It's like, that works. Yes, sometimes it is the people you know. But a lot of the times, you really need to be able to prove with that networking that you are the right person for that job. Number eight, apply as a QA tester. Often the most common entry-level role you can get when starting out is applying for quality assurance roles. Quality assurance can be a great entry path into the game industry. It's basically testing, and uh, there's a lot of people that want to test video games, but they have to realize that it's different from playing video games. You're actually playing the game in order to break the game. Essentially, if you're one of those people who likes to push the game to their limits and try to do things you probably shouldn't be doing, this might be a good job for you. A lot of higher profile game developers started out in QA and worked their way up, making this a choice idea for getting your foot in the door. You're basically producing bug reports so that the programmers and the artists can find what you detected, reliably reproduce it, and then fix it. Number seven, build an online portfolio. Let's see, I'm 1.8 meters tall, ruggedly handsome, chiseled abs, amazing hair. This should be a no-brainer, especially if you're an artist, but getting a portfolio or a showreel online that's easy to access by anyone is really important for getting any job in the industry. It doesn't matter if all the content isn't game-related, as employers are often looking to see if you are skilled and well-experienced enough to handle the work. A well-organized portfolio and resume is an easy way to convey this. From an art perspective, it's really all about your portfolio. It's the quality of the work. It doesn't really matter how you got there, whether it was from art school or self-taught. It's all about a really awesome portfolio that'll just blow away an employer. Number six, internships and practical experience. This is very good if you're just starting out or you need to get the feel of working with a team. Internships might not be great for your morale since you won't be getting paid, but it certainly helps for all those job listings that say you need two to three years of experience. Yes, taking up internships and getting work experience seems like something that can go with any field, but it's just as relevant here as in any other real world job. While there are horror stories of interns being overworked for no financial reward, ideally you'll be in the right place when they start looking to fill paying positions. One thing I would tell anyone looking to get in the game industry is that you have to be insanely just persistent and tenacious. You cannot give up after the first no. You have to just never give up. It doesn't matter how, doesn't matter how many no's you get. Number five, get into social media. Thank you all so much for supporting us and continuing to support us watching us on YouTube and on Twitch. This one is for all you who prefer to get a job as a video game journalist, reviewer, or live streamer. Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, set yourself up with an online presence for greater recognition. You can and should alternatively write lots of blogs on gaming. And don't stop, because whether it's on gaming news, reviews, or opinions in the industry, the more you write, the better you'll get at it. For more on live streaming, check out our video on top 10 ways to make money playing video games. It, there's several things that can make you unique and different from a streamer, but you don't just want to be a bland, boring personality that's mediocre at the game. You're not going to get viewers that way. Number four, specialize in your field. One of the biggest mistakes you can make in a job interview is to say that you'll do anything. Remember, you're not the only one going for that job. It's usually about sticking to one field and being the best at it not just doing everything sort of averagely. Make sure you know what you want to do when you go in for your interview. Don't kind of say that you could do multiple things or that you're a jack of all trades. No one's really looking for someone to do multiple things out the gate. They want to know what you can specialize in. The main fields for any development team are usually art design, programming, and game design. You'll basically need to pick one and focus the best you can. 
Though, with game design, yeah, best to hear it for yourself. Game design is tough. You usually have to claw your way in and then eventually move across to uh, doing design. Number three, a college education. These days, many colleges offer degrees in the fundamentals of game design, programming, and the expectations you'll meet in your career. It's especially important to get a college degree if you want to get into programming, as most employers will require you to be familiar in common programming languages. However, people working in the industry come from a variety of academic backgrounds, not just programming or game design. Higher education clearly makes you a better candidate for a number of reasons. You get better writing, better social skills, better time management ability, more school probably won't hurt your chances. I'd encourage people to go to the best school that they can and really try to get good grades because that helps you get your foot in the door. It helps your resume stand ahead. Number two, start making games. Mm. There's a video game I'm making. It's kind of like a side project. Oh, good for you, honey. Even if it's in your spare time as just a hobby or starting a small studio with your friends and college classmates, if you want to start making games, you better start doing it now. Honestly, there is no better teacher to highlight your strengths and weaknesses than yourself. Your first project will probably suck, yes, but it's all part of the learning experience. The internet is awash with tools and tutorials that can help you make your first game, many of them absolutely free or for a very reasonable sum. If you can include a small game or demo in your portfolio, that's certainly going to earn you extra points with employers and will help demonstrate your dedication, which of course leads to our number one tip. If you're not willing to sacrifice your weekends and nights, then someone else is going to and they're going to step on there and make sure that you don't get that job. Number one, be dedicated, like really dedicated. It's a really cutthroat industry out there. Everyone wants to make video games. You're potentially looking at 70 hour work weeks on average, so be sure that you're absolutely passionate about making games. Also, be ready to move to another state or even another country when going to your next job with only a few months notice, especially if there's nothing in your immediate vicinity. You might be in one part of the country, maybe someone says yes to you, but they're like a couple states over. Go take that job. You need that experience. That's the most important thing. If you aren't willing to put in the work, chances are there's someone else who will. And perhaps most importantly, always be willing to admit that you screwed up. Because if you think your boss is a tough critic, wait till you start hearing from consumers. Always work harder than the person next to you, even if it's yourself. You are never working hard enough. I do 60, 70 hour weeks on the normal. Do you agree with our list? Oh, now be honest, Apollo. Are you as thick as you look? Is there any other advice you'd be willing to give anyone who wants to start making video games? Don't be a dick. There's a good tip. All right. There's a good tip. Yeah. Now there's a good tip. So that's a good video. If for some reason this didn't tape well or whatever, make sure you check that video out. Um, it, it'll definitely help. All right, and then I don't remember where we were left off with Tiled. Are you guys doing everything with Tiled at this point? Are you already creating the um, the red dots and you're making collision domains? Um, hopefully you are. Uh, if you are, then don't worry about this. And if you aren't, make sure you read this stuff. Um, and don't forget, like, uh, follow the video, create the layer, call it collisions, uh, have the collision stuff, um, change the size to make it viewable, but you get the idea. All right, so then again, there's that video for tiled, um, how to make everything like work out and how to make the collision parts and the parts you can walk in front of and the parts you can walk behind of and the different layers, you get the idea. All right, sprites, ray! All right, I'm not gonna watch this next video. You guys can watch it, you know, obviously at home. Um, but basically they use pixels and pixels are, are just obviously the little square dots that we make. And this, this video shows you how to make a sprite out of paint. So what I want you to do is to watch this video or another video, find an asset that you like, you know, find a, a sprite online that you think you can uh, replicate, uh, replicate, and then um, build that in paint and you're going to submit that. So there's going to be a, a Dropbox this week that says, you know, um, a sprite Dropbox, and that's where you're going to drop your sprite. So use Microsoft Paint or some other program, you know, blow it up big size so you can kind of see the little squares and then see if you can recreate that sprite. Uh, and if for some reason you have a hard time, like, hey, what's a sprite? What's going on? Um, let me jump to the, you know, here I just typed in sprite character and hit images. Um, and you can, again, and this is all made with little dots. So you can just pick out one, whether it's a dude or a girl or, or uh, that's freaky. Now, you're not doing stuff like that. Obviously, that's way too smooth. Um, you're doing pixelated stuff. So pick something out like one of these 
uh, and see if you can recreate it in paint just using the dots um, based on that video that I that included there. So remember, not all six, you just need one little sprite. So find a sprite that you think you can do, whether it's that dude, that dude, that girl, but you get the idea. Batman, <laughs> I was like Duck Man, <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, just make a sprite, just to see how easy it is. So that's one of your assignments this week is to make a sprite. All right, and then some comments on the, um, the book. Now, starting now, each week, you're gonna get an asset package. And then every chapter before you start on your project, you're gonna have to load that asset package because the, the rest of the chapter, like chapter two, is gonna have you do different things based on the assets that you just loaded. Um, so basically all you have to do is go to the project pane, uh, right click on asset and hit import package, then custom package, and then select the corresponding file. So when we're talking about chapter two, you're gonna import the chapter two file. When we're talking about chapter three, you're gonna import the chapter three file. So from now on each week, you're gonna see an asset package for each chapter in your folder. Um, and you'll need to load that before you start uh, working on your 2D platformer game based from the book. All right, so in the book, at the end of chapter one, page 25, um, it has you create a game object called player. And then if you go to pay, or chapter two, page 34 has you create another game object called player. You don't need two of those, and apparently that's just a mistake uh, on the developer side, or the, who, whoever wrote the book. Um, you only need the one. So if you already created player at the end of chapter one, you do not need to do it in chapter two from page 34. All right, on page 34, you're gonna skip steps two and well, one and two. So on page 34, skip steps one and two. On step five of page 35, make sure that when you're done that you change the layer of the player from default to player after you create the new layer. Now, after this video, I'm gonna shoot a video where I'm gonna walk you through um, what you should do this week for your game. And then two other notes, um, on page 37, skip step two. That's now automatically added when you create a sprite. And then on page 37, step three, they're referring to the small dot on the right side of the sprite box. So if you look where it says sprite, then it has like a little drop down box or a box where you can type stuff into it. To the very right of that is like a little dot and then like a little circle. That's the small dot they're talking about in step three on page 37. Um, but if any of this is unclear, make sure you watch the other video um, for where I show you um, how to do the project stuff this week. And then I'd also like to add, <laughs> page 38, 39 has you create a prefab called player, but one has already been created when you imported the package. So if you just rename it to player old and then follow the steps on that page, that'll work too. And then at the bottom of page 39, step two, make sure you click on the prefab in the project pane and not the player game object in the hierarchy pane when you do that. So at the bottom of page 39, step two, make sure you're clicking on the prefab in the project pane and not the player game object in the hierarchy pane. Woo! All right. So at this point, uh, if this was a face-to-face -face class, you could either work on your 2D, your tiled map, if you haven't finished that yet, um, or you can work on your sprite image, um, or you can work on your game video, or I'm sorry, your, your 2D platformer game, uh, the overall thing of the project. So, woo, it's a long one, guys. Sorry about that. And then there's another video coming um, that will also be in this folder where I walk you through um, setting up your 2D uh, project. And then from this point forward, every week, you're probably gonna get a lecture video. Then you're gonna get a second video where I walk you through the Unity process um, of adding the assets to you and then making the changes to make your game kind of go. So that's it. Remember, if you have any questions, uh, make sure you email me and you guys all know my office hours. <laughs>